Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He is a managing member of Mirmican Capital LLC, and he's the author of an upcoming book about financial history. It's going to be a very extensive tome. I think it's over 400 pages. He's also working on a condensed version, I think, of around 150 pages. He's going to shorten it out there eventually after the main book comes out for listeners who love financial history. So, Dan Oliver, thank you for joining me again. Well, great to be here. Now, Dan, before we talk about financial history, which some of my list I love and some of my listeners really enjoy, and I, unfortunately, a lot of experts out there just don't bring up the topic enough. I think it's a, a very important topic. Let's get your views on the current global macro macroeconomic situation and what the central banks have done basically in the last 10 years since Lehman Brothers. Yeah, sure. So I, I, I think you know, the reason I've been working on my book for so long is because if you look back at financial history, you realize that nothing, nothing has changed, uh, not just over the last decade or, or century, but over thousands of years. My my favorite fun fact of, of what I dug up in my research was uh, the panic of AD 33 in Rome. Uh, the first century historian Tacitus talks about this, and what he writes is extraordinary. He says that because of a stringency in the money market, the Emperor Tiberius took 100 million sestares out of the imperial treasury, lent them to the banks for three years at no interest against real estate collateral. Now, anyone who pays any attention to financial affairs knows that that is precisely what Hank Paulson's uh, tarp was. I mean, to, to the very last detail. And Paulson never credited the Emperor Tiberius with the idea. But you know, what I so find so extraordinary about that story is you, you hear that one story and, and you know that what was happening in Rome 2,000 years ago is absolutely no different than what was happening in Wall Street 2008. And, and this is important because one of the fundamental assumptions of Marxism, Keynesianism, and monetarism is that modernity is somehow different in kind than the ancient world. We, we have capitalism. We have all this industrial capital. They didn't. So therefore, economics is completely different. And again, that one story tells you that that's absolutely untrue. It's absolutely false, that nothing has changed. And, and the reason this is so important is because if you go back and you read economic uh, textbooks written in the, as late as the 1890s, they, they looked at economics as a humanity. So what happened in Rome and ancient Greece, and the Middle Ages mattered. It was the story about man and his environment and, and his nature. Uh, and then, of course, by the time you get to the 1920s, uh, Keynes and Irving Fisher had turned economics into a science. So all they care about now is data series, and you can't get data series in ancient Rome. And so they pretend it didn't happen. It doesn't exist. So, so the whole point of what I'm trying to do is to take that body of knowledge that was completely abandoned after the 1890s and update it to the current time and show that all the principles that they derived back then, not, not through data sets and economic econometrics, but just through reason and history applied to our world. So it's a long way of introduction into answering your question, which is that um, you have to remember that uh, the Fed does not really blow bubbles. Pe people think that, but what the Fed does is it bails the banking system out after the banking system blows the bubbles itself. It's it's the bubbles come from the very nature of the fracks reserve banking system. And what 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 happens is the banks take over that deposits and they lend them out uh, uh, for 10 year projects, the 30 year projects. And it's that maturity mismatch that creates the bubble. Um, and so then what happens is you get over capacity and long uh, big capital items. Uh, the, the, the cash flow goes away and the Fed has to run and bail it out. So that, that's what happened in 2008, right? The bank system created all that credit, built all those houses they shouldn't have built and, and all those loans that should never be made and all those complicated structures that never should have been built. And when it blew up, the, the, all the banks went running to the government and said, hey, you got to bail us out or else we're going to go down and the ATM machines won't work. So the Fed ran in and, and gave them a lot of credit. Now, where a lot of people went wrong, including myself, because I knew a lot less then than I do now, was – they thought that because the Fed was, quote unquote, printing money, we would see inflation, even possibly hyperinflation. All this money hit the market and prices went crazy. But that's not really what happens. What happens is, and, and Bernanke is actually right when he's talking about this, that, that what the Fed does is it provides credit to the banks. So the banks will run out and start making more of the crazy loans that they were making before. And what that does is it re-stimulates all these things that require credit. So, so not going to the grocery store and buying 
uh, bananas, but but building uh, you know office buildings and malls and ships and airplanes and all those sorts of things. And, and, and so that and that's what happened. If you look at where the economy, what, what happened to the economy in the last 10 years, we, we've had a huge, huge increase in business loans, a partial to uh, start buybacks to enrich the, the, the executives at the expense of the, of the shareholders, but, but also to uh, to finance all these uh, uh, enormous capital items. And, and what happens is you get overcapacity. And, and if that happens at the same time the Fed starts raising rates, you're in big trouble. And that's exactly what's happening now. You know, I live in New York City. I look at my window. It looks like Shanghai. There, there's a crane on every single block going up, building a huge office tower. And the reason is because uh, it takes a long time to build an office tower or, or residential tower. You have to start planning it for years, and then you buy the real estate, then you finance it, and then you build it. So all these buildings going up in New York City were all planned five, six years ago uh, when interest rates were at zero for the banks. Of course, the, 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 the uh, developers don't pay zero, but they pay a, a spread on that. So it's very, very low. So these things made sense. Well, now what's happening is that the rents in New York City are actually falling, commercial rents and real estate, uh, re re residential rents are, are going down. At the same time, you have this huge capacity that hasn't even come online yet. They're still building these things. So they're going to hit the market right as uh, the rents collapse. And this is a microcosm of what happens to the whole planet uh, uh, when the banks go crazy and start finding us in all these things. Of course, the poster child isn't New York City, it's China. But it's the same story everywhere you look. It, when the banks are very active, they, they naturally do what they're doing now, and then it naturally collapses. And, th and that's where we are in the cycle. We, we've gone over the top. We probably have the top. You know, we won two, three years ago. The Fed is tightening. Uh, you, you see rents of, of long-term capital items like GE. What, what does GE manufacture? Manufactures locomotives and power plants, all those sorts of things. Huge capital items that have huge, huge uh, uh, lifespans. And that's what gets the most. And that's what you're seeing. So I, I, I think we're very, very near the end of this cycle. And the stock market volatility is telling you that. The interest rates are telling you that. And what I find uh, particularly uh, uh, interesting and, and concerning if you're in the traditional markets is that normally at this point in the cycles when the Fed starts making uh, uh, nice noises about supporting things, they might not act, but at least they go out and give speeches about how they'll support the markets if they need to. But this time around, uh, the Fed knows that the asset market's got out of control and they're still running around saying they're going to ra raise rates two, three, four more times uh, before they stop. And so instead of soothing noises, they're being more aggressive. And so again, if you are uh, uh, being stressed by the, the, this debt pyramid that is now starting to crumble and the Fed is saying, hey, we're going to make it worse. Uh, I, I think it's hard to envision uh, this cycle lasting much longer than, than, than it is now. And to add to your points there, there's a ton of cranes in the Washington, D.C. metro area, too. So there's nonstop construction cranes. I think just around the Washington Nationals, our, our baseball team here that moved here a little over 10 years ago, just around their new baseball stadium, there's over a dozen cranes just in a, a couple block radius. It's amazing. So, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I took the train up from D.C. to New York and you, you see the skyline and it is unbelievable. I mean, it, it's just it's incredible. But again, it's it's a microcosm of, of what the bank system creates through, throughout the whole economy. So the Fed has a history, at least for the last couple of decades, whether it's Paul Volcker or Greenspan and then pass the, the baton on to Bernanke before the 2008 financial crisis of eventually when they get into the, the rate hike pattern, eventually they do break something because the economy is – over leveraged, there's too much debt, there's too much credit. You know, I don't think any real lessons were learned since the 2008 financial crisis. Look how much global debt and global credit has grown, whether it's go on the government balance sheet or in the private sector. And, you know, look at the amount of junk debt or near junk debt that has exploded since then. So I think there's a lot of credit bubbles. And if the Fed keeps hiking, eventually, you know, these asset bubbles or credit bubbles could, could burst. But you said there's been no hyperinflation. So in the real economy, I think there is inflation. I think it's stagflation. But I think there's an argument to be made that the asset prices, whether it's stocks, bonds, real estate with valuations, I think there's an argument to be made there that those are have basically been hyperinflated and that the wealth gap between the rich and poor has been exacerbated and the disparity between the real economy and the asset prices has been exacerbated as well. Yeah, no, I, of course I agree. I mean, what, what, what I mean, no inflation, hyperinflation, what I mean is the, there was an idea that because the Fed tripled their balance sheet, uh, the, the price of bread would triple. Uh, and, and of course, that, that didn't happen. I mean, of course, there's inflation. Of course, that if you, if you define inflation as asset inflation, there's been massive amounts of asset inflation that, as you say, has concentrated wealth uh, at, at the top at the expense of the bottom. And of course, 
Bernanke was running around saying we're doing this to help the working man. I mean, that's absurd. Uh, it, it was helping the, the bankers and the people who own stocks. But but those people also get hurt. Don't forget when the when the bubble cracks and you, you've got used to not working, you you stop working or you start doing something else, and then all of a sudden your stock stocks disappear. Uh, that that's very disruptive. Uh, and so it, it's socially disruptive on every level. On the way up, it's disruptive because you screw the workers. On the way down, it's disruptive because you screw the people who are relying on their assets. Uh, to live, but I, I, I want to pick up on what you said earlier about the the lessons not being learned. It's it's actually worse than it was in two thousand seven, and the reason it's worse is because at least through the 2000, 2000, 2007, a lot of the stuff was on the bank balance sheets, and so people knew where it was. And when the crisis began, the Fed knew what to do, which was to go isolate these banks and bail them out. Now, I mean, again, because I'm an Austrian, I think we'd better let it collapse and start over. But but that's what they did. Now, because of the rules they passed that don't allow the banks to hold these things, all this toxic stuff has gone on these off-balance sheet uh, uh, shadow bank system uh, 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 structures. And so nobody really knows where they are or, or how big they are or, or where the pieces fall. In fact, I had a meeting this morning uh, with a guy who uh, his business is valuing uh, illiquid assets for hedge funds. Hedge funds buy the stuff and they have no idea what it's worth because it doesn't trade in the market. So they need to call guys in to tell them what it's worth. What he tells me is that uh, that uh, places like KKR, you know, they, they securitize this stuff with these levered loans to corporations. They, 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 they lend money to companies that already have too much debt. Uh, so that, that's why they're levered up. Uh, they get high returns for doing that, obviously. And then most of these things are covenant light. So in the past, you'd have financial covenants. So if the company ran into trouble, uh, if their income started declining against their assets, for example, uh, the, the bank could come in or the lenders could come in and say, hey, we're shutting you down because you want to grab the assets and sell them while they still have value. When you don't have covenants, what happens is the companies can keep running at a loss until all the assets are gone. Because, again, the management has no interest in shutting it down because they become option holders. So at, at that point, the lenders have no recovery because all the assets are literally gone by the time the music stops. By the time they miss their last coupon payment, there are no assets. So so you have that problem. And then apparently some of these structures now, you know, they're, they're structures so that by definition, the first principal payments go to the APs, the, the top uh, uh, tranche of the of – the, um, of the securitization, which makes it the safest. But apparently some of these originators uh, put in the fine print that the B piece, the piece of the originator's key, the, the subordinated piece, get to sweep a dividends and profits to themselves. And so the, so the A piece winds up being subordinate to the B piece, and they don't even know it. Uh, you know it what's, what, what's happened is that there's so much credit in the world looking for returns. All these pension funds, the international pension funds, uh, 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 desperately looking for investments and, and that is the market. So if you don't want to play that game, and if you, if you know the game is crooked, you know what are you going to do with your cap like a return? And by the way, it's not your money if you're working for a pension fund or someone else's money. So you don't really care that much. I mean, you care, but it's not your money when it, when it goes down. So it so the structures have actually made it more brittle because it's not in the bank's balance sheet, and so it's not going to be obvious uh, uh, where to plug the holes when when the when the music stops. The, the other thing besides central bank intervention and their expansion of their balance sheets and the QE programs that the different central banks have done is that, like you said, a lot of people are truly desperate for income. The pension funds have not met their obligations. A lot of retirees in the past who wouldn't take on risk, they could have gotten five or six percent in U.S. Treasuries. They can't get that anymore. So they've had to take more and more risk to get you know, a uh, uh, 3% on a dividend stock that's way overvalued or 4% or 5% on junk debt. So they've had to take just an enormous amount of risk. And on top of this, you know, the pension fund managers, mm, they shouldn't be taking this type of risk. But I've, I've heard that they've gotten involved in this leverage short volatility trade because they could sell vol, sell insurance and collect premium. So that's another economic landmine, a very large one. Just in stocks alone, I think Christopher Cole of Artemis Capital says over $1.5 trillion. That's not counting the leverage short volatility trades on all these other asset classes that people have done taking this ridiculous amount of risk just for a little bit more income. And I would say that's because of what central banks have done. It, now the Fed's hiking rates, but the other central banks have not hike, hiked rates. And we've had financial repression for a long time. And I think they're what then? There's over, what, $9 trillion still in negative interest rate bonds? 
Yeah, well, I, th- this is an old, old story. And again, I go back to the 19th century when the way it played out was um, the bank rate in London would get too low because of the bank's operations. And so people would sit around and say, hey, that's not enough return on my capital. So they start lending it to places like Argentina uh, you know, for, for commodity projects. This is, this is like 1820s stuff. Right. And, and then what happened is you get a big bubble in emerging markets because capital it really shouldn't be going there. It goes there because it has to. And then what would happen is when rates started setting, resetting higher, uh, the first places to get hit would be the very uh, uh, undercapitalized places like Argentina. And so you have, you have a big crisis there. And it would take about a year for that uh, problems to see back towards the center of the Bank of England and the Bank of England would respond by, by you know, billing it for now. So it's an old story. And again, it's, you know, knowing that history, it's very interesting to see in the last few months, Argentina blow up again in Turkey, right? Because this is the same story. You had a lot of European banks, especially in the, in the Turkish story, that needed yield. They had to have yield because that's their mandate. And again, these are agents. These aren't principals. People paid to get yield. So they lent it all to the, the Turkish uh, banking system, which invested all in office towers and shopping malls. Uh, and, and then you get big overcapacity in those things. Much, you know, Turkey has t- tons of malls they don't need. And then uh, prices go down and, and Turkish defaults. And then your bank system in Europe is, is all is, is all screwed up. And, you know, my understanding is that the Italian bank system is in really, really big trouble because they've played this game a little too much. Again, because they were searching for yield because the policymakers and their wisdom put rates down to zero. And and so this is this is always what happens. And you know, it, so and again, this is why I go back to history. It's because looking at history and seeing what's happened before tells you what's going to happen in the future. Because human nature simply does not change, and capital doesn't change, and interest rates, what signals doesn't change. So all these things are exactly the same. And again, knowing what's happened in the past tells you what will happen in the future. Yeah, and if I could add to your points there, another example in financial history that I've read, there was a book that came out over 100 years ago, but I read it only a couple of years ago in the PDF version, and it was about the 1789 French hyperinflation of the Assignon, if I pronounce that correctly. And so they did basically, uh, they had a fiat currency, but they tried backing it, and then they were doing quantitative easing, their version of it, and they tried backing the currency with like ecclesiastical, like church real estate. And despite the real estate backing, the currency still got hyperinflated, right? And eventually that that accelerated the French Revolution. No, uh, well, that that's that's exactly right. I mean, uh, that that is. I mean, you know, Andrew Dickinson White wrote wrote the definitive treatment on that. But no, that, that, that's it. They printed money. Everyone was happy. Lowered interest rates. You know, everyone got rich, and then all of a sudden it wore off, and and rates went up, and lots of business went went under, and people got upset. And so they said, "Hey, we know what to do. We'll print more money." And they kept doing that until the currency collapsed. And, and along the way, what's interesting is you see uh, all the familiar uh, things were we, the, the, to history where the the French authorities started abandoning the use of gold and silver, for example, right? I mean, today in our, in our country, we don't have gold and silver. We have cash. And, and every prominent economist you, you read wants to ban cash because it allows the state to keep uh, total control of money and credit. And so this is a very old idea. It's not a new idea. It's an old idea. And it doesn't work, of course, because once you start doing that, you no longer have a market. And there's no way that a complex society like ours can function as a command and control system, it has to be market system. So when you make it a command and control system, uh, the wheels are pop- popping out and and uh, and you get a depression. So I mean, that that's that's where we're headed. And that's a scary thing, right? When when the market crashes and the authorities want to do something about it, uh, and what they do, of course, is intervene more in the market, uh, eventually pr- productivity uh, collapses. And, and then you've got two choices. You've got the the fascism choice, right? Which is what Germany and Italy did. They said, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna really put the government in charge and make sure everything works," uh, which of course is a disaster. Or you let the whole thing collapse and, and let free markets come back in, into into play. And and that's what concerns me because when you look at our government and you look at the surveillance state is that, that they've constructed, and the police state, and all the powers that they have, which are all unconstitutional, but they have them now. And of course, have signed off on it. Uh, they they definitely have the power to do that. And so when the when the next big 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 crisis comes. I'm very worried about what happens to uh, our country, and and not just the economics, but the politics that uh, sustain us as a free as a free country. 
Me too. I, I completely agree about that. And Bernie Sanders is is an example of, you know, you mentioned fascism, but there's different forms of collectivism and totalitarian government. So you have a ton now in the United States of democratic socialists, basically people who are who are different degrees of socialist or Marxist now. And, you know, it's it's just the amount of people, especially graduating college, like if you come out of college and you don't have a job or you have a shitty job and you can barely pay your student loan debts and you don't don't have a good life. You know, the promises of socialism minus the reality of not being able to pay for anything that the politicians are promising is going to sound appealing to you. No, of, of course it does. And of course, when I say fascism, people may think, oh, you know, jackboots and concentration camps. That, that happens at the end. That's not the, 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 fascism was an economic system, which was not socialism or communism. The idea was that government would get in cahoots with the big, huge uh, uh, companies and the big trade unions and run everything. And that's more or less what Obama did, right? I mean, he like health insurance. He didn't try to nationalize socialist health, health insurance, which would uh, uh, – Sanders wants to do. He got the three big guys in a room and, and said, "We're we're going to manage you. Tell you what to do." And and so you know the different flavors, but it, it's all based on this Marxist idea that the government can run things and the market doesn't work. Uh, and and of course it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy, as you know, because the more they intervene in the market, the market the less the market does work, and then the more support there is, more intervention in the market. And 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 that's the treadmill that we've been on really since FDR, and and now it's really accelerating because. Because it's true, you know, our market doesn't work, and it doesn't work because it's not a free market. And you're right; people taking all the student debt to go to college, and they get out, they can't get a job, and it's very enticing to say, "Hey, the, uh, capitalism doesn't work," and so let's try something else. I mean, it makes perfect sense. And of course, no one at, at university taught them about economics, real economics, so they have no idea. So I, I don't blame those people at all. I mean, I, can, I understand where they're coming from, but of course, the result uh, will be a disaster. And that is one of my big fears: if the market does crash, as I expect it will. In the near future, uh, I can definitely see 2020 having a left-wing Trump. And uh, I mean, can you imagine what this country would look like with uh, Pelosi running the House, Schumer running the Senate, and then a Cory Booker or Elizabeth Warren? She, she's probably damaged she goes now, but but someone someone that left-wing in the presidency. I mean, it really is terrifying. I mean, the, it, it it would be the end of capitalism and and 70s much only much much worse. And I don't know, you know, at least in the 70s when we had all those problems. It was still a pretty homogenous Protestant country with deep cultural roots uh, in, in terms of Western civilization and, 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 and the belief in individual rights. And I don't know that we still have that um, uh, cohesiveness in this country. And so when, when, when these bad things happen, I mean, it, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's very scary. And if those Democrats gain control of Congress and the presidency, like a Bernie Sanders type, you know, they may try to implement a China social credit score type of thing. And, you know, people like me who have a pretty large YouTube channel may end up in prison because China well, is it's, it's already happening. It's already happening. And by the way, you know, uh, the Supreme Court, I, you know, you want to hope to be a bulwark, but you know, they, they can pack it. Nothing in the Constitution says it's going to be nine people. So when they uh, control all branches of government, they can make it 29 people. I mean, uh, it could be anything. So. Uh, there, there's almost nothing left. I mean, it really is scary. It really is scary. Yeah, and F FDR tr tried to totally subvert the Constitution. So we're heading back to what FDR tried to do if the Democrats gain con uh, control of the Supreme Court, the presidency, and both houses. But you have people like Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Casio ortez and the guy Andrew, Andrew Gillum, who's running for governor of Florida. And, you know, they're promising people all these things that, that in reality – government cannot afford. So free healthcare, free education. I mean, look what happened in Venezuela. So the people out there who believe in socialism, we should s send them on a trip to Venezuela for to see what actually happens in reality. Because a lot of promises were made by Chavez, Hugo Chavez and Maduro in Venezuela. And the rich people in Venezuela, the political cronies there, I mean, they're filthy rich. They've bought houses in Miami. They, they're they not getting hurt by the hyperinflation, really, at least not yet. There's no French Revolution with guillotines, but uh, pretty much everyone else who stayed in Venezuela has gotten absolutely destroyed. Yeah, that's right. You can go to Venezuela or, you know, just just watch some 70s TV shows. I I, 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 I saw the, uh, some clip of The Incredible Hulk in the couple, last couple of years. And just the music, the whole thing's so depressing. You know, it's just, oh, it's so awful. And, and it was because it was filmed in the 70s and people were very depressed. <laughs> it was the Asian Malay, as they call it, Carter called it. Uh, so, I mean, it, no, it's a disaster. But again, you can see the force of pushing that direction. You know why it's happening. You know, I, it, you, you, you know, one should live in a country where not everybody has to be an economist to understand this stuff, like in the 19th century, when people just inherently believed in self-responsibility, limited government, and all those things. That's all you really needed. Uh, but, but now, 
uh, uh, there, there's great uh, angst about those ideas because, uh, as you said, the injustice of our economic system is so is so blatant that people are desperate for for solutions. And it's always easier to say let let's have the government fix it than it is to actually identify the problem as the government and saying, hey, let's get rid of the government and try something else. That, that's a very scary thing to do, to get rid of the government, because then you know what's going to happen. And you know, there was a moment, actually, in, in West Germany, when the, the U.S. Uh, occupying force, uh, uh, led by Keynesian ideas, uh, continued all the policies the Nazis had had of, of, of capital controls and, and uh, price controls and controls and economic activity. And, of course, West Germany collapsed. And they, they reached a moment which was, hey, do we, do we really double down on this stuff and turn ourselves into more of a police state with American occupiers to, to really push these economic ideas or do we just let them go? And they let them go. Uh, they just, the whole thing collapsed one day and uh, all the economic controls. And, uh, you know, Jacques Rueff was there who wound up being uh, Charles de Gaulle's economic minister. And he said, the next day, you know, activities were <laughs> sprang up again, just spontaneously. People came out and started working and rebuilding and all those things. And it, he said it was a shock, even for those who, who advocate for free markets, just how fast it recovered once the uh, government got out of their way. So, I mean, that is what happens eventually. But unfortunately, the the more... Uh, usual outcome is is more state control and usually a good war or two because you need you need war to get the population to uh, to support the government. That, that's what makes me nervous about China. Right, because China is a huge credit bubble, and 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 once the economies uh, start losing control, that they, they'll need to placate the population somehow. And the best way to do that is to pick up foreign enemy and and uh, and put it to war because everyone puts up with privation when you've got a great national cause like war going on. So th- you definitely you typically see. That the incredible too. So it's it's uh, yeah, again very scary times we're heading into. And President Trump seems hell bent on escalating you know the trade war with China. There's there's some reasons that are you know justified for him trying to trying to save the U.S. companies intellectual property and things like that. But you know this is leading to a cold war, and that's oh, I, like a best case yeah. scenario probably between the U.S. and China, right? A, a cold war where there's no actual fighting. I I think that's right. I mean I you know I. I mean, I, I'm pro-Trump in the sense that I'm anti-Hillary, uh, but I have been disappointed that that um, he, he hired the neocons to do his foreign policy and Goldman Sachs to do his domestic policy. So really, what's the difference for, for the you know, main political things? It's all the same people, and that's disappointing and, and scary. I mean, I, I, mean I, I think China is a, a 19th century mercantilist uh, a state that is aggressively expanding. And so, I, I you know, again, the question is, should, should, you know, is it our role to be an imperial power? It certainly has been since World War II, but do we want that role? That was never the intention of our founding fathers. And George Washington warned us not to travel beyond our borders. He said, look, we, you've got two great oceans on the other side. We have two passive neighbors on the north and south. You know, why get involved in the rest of the world? And there's, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to that view. I, I do think China is a very bad actor, but I question whether we need to uh, uh, be the one to uh, you know, t- protect the rest of the world. From them, I, I'd also just mention quickly on, on China. It's a little off topic, but if you if you cast your mind back to when the Clinton administration was ta- was thinking about whether to integrate China into the world economy, the WTO, and other things like that, the argument was that uh, that if we started trading with China uh, with free markets, that uh, just by its nature, free markets would liberalize the country and and uh, and make it more democratic, and they would just evolve in that direction. And of course, that has proved to be completely untrue. And if anything, the opposite's happened, where, where the U.S., because of these relationships and, and, and because of the huge concentrations of economic power that have resulted, uh, has become less democratic. So in fact, it's been the opposite of what people said would happen. So I, I'm not really against you know, uh, 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 Trump's trade uh, um, policies against China. They, they, they are belligerent. They are. They do cheat. Uh, it, it has been unfair. Uh, but uh, obviously, I think if we can afford conflict, uh, that's, I mean, not, not better, but essential. And it worries me that the neocons are back in charge of uh, foreign policy because I think the, the chances of conflict are much, much higher. And I think China has violated a lot of the different rules when they joined the World Trade Organization or WTO. I think they violated most of the rules that they were supposed to adhere by. And no well, one's like, they, have. they haven't gotten penalized for any of it. Well, everyone's, you know, well, it's their market. They're bigger so big. They think that if they play game, play ball, they'll, they'll get rich when their markets. I, I don't think so. But, uh, but that, that's what the businessmen think. 
So you brought up how like basically interventionism causes more intervention. And Ludwig von Mises talked about this at length, that basically once the intervention starts, they don't want to stop it. They're not going to voluntarily abandon it. So it's like these central planners, these PhD economists, they think that they know the, uh, how to fix the economy. And this is the problem with, you touched on this much earlier in the interview, economics in general. So I think you would agree with me that economics is not a hard science. The, the people who are getting paid over $75,000 per year here in D.C., the thousands of Ph.D. economists here in D.C. working in all the different government agencies, in the Treasury and at the Fed, you know, they would argue otherwise. But I would just say, look at reality, look at their track record and look at their predictions of what would happen and how wrong they've been. Yeah, you know, Steve Lonergan told me that he he led a delegation and could meet Janet Yellen when she was head of the Fed. And he, and he asked her, what is money? And she said, I have 4,000 economists thinking about that every day. <laughs> and he, and he said, why don't you try reading Aristotle? I mean, people have figured it out you know, thousands of years ago. You don't need 4,000 PhD economists thinking about it. What, you know, what, what, what an incredible waste. But but it's, it's a deeper point than that, which is – and again, I've come up against this in my, in my own uh, uh, economic uh, activities, which is um, – the, that the way you get credentialed as an economist uh, today is you have an advanced degree from a Ivy League institution, Columbia or MIT or places like that. And the way you get a degree is an advanced degree is you publish in journals. And who pays for all the journals? Who sponsors them? The answer is the Federal Reserve. They spend about six hundred million dollars every year, money they print up out of thin air on quote unquote economic research. So how many articles do you think there are in journals? Uh, criticizing the Fed. I mean, how about none? Uh, because if you do that, you don't get a degree. And once you have a degree from a top institution, then what you can do is you can go consult for uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland or the IMF or something like that. And that then allows you to go consult for the banks. And the banks pay huge amounts of money to the economists, not because the economists do anything for them, but because it's basically a bribe to keep the economic, uh, the, the economist guild uh, supporting the banks uh, and, and to write papers saying how wonderful the banks are, the bank system is. And so that, that, that's how the whole thing works. And so it, 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 you know, it, the, the class, the guild of economists is a completely closed system, which is why it can't possibly ever reform or adapt, in which why it'll die one day. But, they, but they've successfully squelched out uh, uh, any and all conversations about uh, uh, the nature of the system and how bad it is because they control all the credentialing. That's why, you know, I, I mean, I criticize Trump for hiring all these guys, but the reality is when you become president, you hire people. The only people with the credentials are people who have done this. So then, then you really, I mean, you would be pretty brave to go hire a bunch of guys without credentials to put in these positions. And, and well, you know, he, he, was, he wasn't up for that, unfortunately. Well, well, Dan, the Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, doesn't have a PhD in economics. So that's a rarity there. He has some real world experience. He's been a businessman, a lawyer. He was worked on Wall Street in private equity. He has money, money of his own that he worked hard to get. So, so in that sense, he's true. better than the. True, true. But I mean, I, I would push back a little bit and say that first of all, you know, he 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 made his money through private equity, and the way you make money in private equity is you borrow huge amounts of debt, you deploy it by buying companies, you hope that the Fed lowers rates, and and then you can sell the company and make a bunch of money on on the rate spread, not not necessarily because you fix the company, and that's why private equity's gotten so huge the last forty years because as long as rates keep falling, that business model works really well, and from what I've heard. Uh, he defers almost completely to the staff economists at the Fed because he doesn't want to make a fool of himself because he doesn't know all the lingo that they use in the PhD level. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I, I mean, like, I, I hear your point, and I, I think it's great he's a businessman, but you know, he's he's not a businessman who invented a new product and got rich, uh, 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 satiating consumer demand, right? The the, the mythical. Uh, you know, I mean, Steve Jobs, I think it was a good, I mean, he's a nasty guy, but he did invent something that was good for the consumer. But private equity guys don't do that. They, they, they in, get involved in financial wizardry and yeah. lots of money on that. They're kind of parasites or vultures, and they've also made a lot of money in the past, at least decades ago. They would find undervalued companies before they went to an exchange, invest in the company, and then bring it public. Although now less companies are going public, but normally when a company's going public, it's not undervalued anymore. It's the insiders, like the private equity and the management team at the company, dumping the shares onto the public at a higher valuation. Yeah, well, I mean, it's worse than that because you know, as, as late as the 60s, 
the goal of every loan officer, every bank to a to a company was to see a plan for the company to become debt free. Right. I mean, always the loans you invest it, make money, and then pay the debt back. Um, and, and what happened in the eighties was that if you were debt free, the private equity guys would take you over. They they lever you up with with you know artificial credit from the banks to buy you, and then they let you know, and and then the, the valuation go up because you're using the artificial credit made by the Federal Reserve. So it's a pernicious activity from the very very start. And the people who did it at first, of course, became enormously rich doing it. But again, it's not because they were uh, helping the economy or or, or, or helping uh, uh, you know alleviate consumer demand. Uh, it was because they were simply uh, levering the artificial credit markets that the Federal Reserve made available. And you brought up how the Federal Reserve is paying all this money to academia for research. Well, the documentary that won an Oscar, Inside Job, oh, yeah, Inside Inside Job brought this up as well. They interviewed uh, right. economists, academic ones on the record, although their solution, I'm using air quotes to the financial crisis was, you know, more interventionism because the guy who did it was Democrat and he was a, he was grandstanding for his fellow Democrats. But let's talk about your Real Vision TV discussion a few months ago, the excellent one with Grant Williams and Simon Mikhailovich. So in your, I know you've done extensive research on this with financial history. So in your opinion, how many times has QE been done throughout history in different countries? Oh, I have no idea. But I mean, I, I've looked at specific episodes, um, and and interestingly, there were three uh, bouts of QE in the twenties, right? So what happened in the twenties was uh, uh, during World War One. Well, but the Fed was founded in nineteen fourteen, and it was founded on I mean on, on grounds I agree with. It was really founded to uh, make to liquefy commercial credit, and within a year, they had changed this mandate to fund the government to fight the war. It became a war fighting machine. And so it created all this credit. Um, and what, what it meant to fight the war, of course, was to finance uh, iron ore mines and steel plants and you know, airplane manufacturing, all, all that heavy industry stuff with, with which you fight a war. And when the war ended, uh, in, in, and also stock market bubble was, was, a, was a side effect. And when the war ended, uh, the, all this excess capacity, of course, wanted to make prices plunge because we didn't need so much steel when, when you're not building battleships to go bomb Germans and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so that, that's why you got the Panic of 1921. The Fed actually increased rates intentionally in 1920 to pop the bubble because they knew things were out of control. And then the, the prices collapsed. And that was the very moment when Irving Fisher and Keynes uh, had this idea that um, that the function of the central bank was to, was to create price stability. And and Paul Warburg, the intellectual brains behind the Fed, thought this was crazy. He thought that gold was how you got price stability by tying tying your currency to gold, not by uh, PhDs managing uh, uh, the central bank. But anyway, that that idea of focus, the idea was we had to put prices back to where they were in the teens, even though those prices were artificial. They were only there because of the war bubble. So the Fed starts printing money in that as, as early as late 1921, and it works. Um, commodity prices stabilize, but you still had tons of excess capacity. But what it did is it prevented all, all this capacity from liquidating, which is what the market wanted it to do. And so all the money uh, didn't create consumer inflation because of all this excess capacity. Instead, it went into the market and set the market higher. Then the, fight, the Fed tightened to try to unwind their QE, and commodity prices started tanking again. So they, they printed again, and they did it a third time. Uh, and each time, all they would do is manage to stabilize commodity prices because, again, there was so much excess capacity they wanted to liquidate, and, and the money would go into the market. And so the markets are extremely higher. And then uh, in 1928, they got spooked. Uh, Benjamin Strong, who was the head of the Fed of New York, died, and so the power shifted to, to Washington. And they started raising rates as they had in 1920 with the intention of popping the bubble. And boy, did they ever. Uh, and once it popped, of course, they tried to about face and print money, but it was far too late. And 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 that story that you that I just explained, of course, is precisely what happened. Uh, not just in the period from two thousand to two thousand eight, right? It's the same story, right? The internet bubble popped. Uh, the Fed starts printing money to maintain price stability. All the money goes to the market, the, uh, the stock market, asset markets, housing, and stocks go crazy. They raise rates. Uh, uh, the first thing Bernanke did when it became uh, head of the Fed was slow the money printing. Well, a couple of years later, the, the, the market blows up. So they did the same thing again. So it's this pattern they've been doing over and over and over again. And, uh, and so here we are again at the end of that uh, cycle. And my big question is, does it work again right, when the market blows up? 
and the Fed runs in and guarantees everything inside and prints money and, 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 and bails everyone out. Does it work again and we get a bigger bubble and, and Mars go even higher than before and then it blows up again? Or, or, or do you get to the end of a super cycle, the way they got to an end of a super cycle in 1929, where the things just all liquidate and there's just not nothing they can do about it? Um, and and I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. But again, as a gold investor, I, I don't care at this point because I think gold is going up either way when, when the Fed has to intervene to say the system. And then the question will be after that. Does gold weaken again in the next bubble? Because but, but bubble gold always does badly during the bubble. It does it does well when the bubble ends? Uh, so so does gold do badly at the end of the next cycle, or is this the end of the super cycle and gold is going to shoot up to you know ten ten thousand uh, dollars an ounce plus? I mean, that that's the question. But I'm not worried about that now because I think either way we're, we're we have to live through this uh, end of this mini cycle first, and then we can talk about whether it's the super cycle or not. So before we talk about gold, more a couple comments here about like financial history and psychology. So I think a lot of this has to do because I've studied financial history as well. I read a biography on Genghis Khan and it was talking about the Mongolian empire after Genghis Khan, how they went to paper money, like a fiat currency. And how for a while it was successful, the government, the Mongolian empire preferred fiat currency over gold and silver, but eventually they hyperinflated it too. And Michael Maloney just has two new episodes out for Hidden Secrets of Money, and he's going through excellent video production there. I think he spent th many thousands of dollars on that. And, you know, it's going through the history of Rome with, you know, clipping coins, switching to copper. I think for a brief period of time, Rome even had like tokens that were worthless. But that, you know, yeah, that's, no, that's the right. But but interesting that the, the Chinese, you know, I, I read some Chinese com commentary, 14th century Chinese commentary on on that, and and one thing that said was that the, the the fake money allowed the Khan to spend outrageously, <laughs> and I love that phrase because that's of course exactly what our government does; it spends out. Registry. And, and then he observed later that, uh, and this is the quotation, he, he wrote, but in the present time, they do not know how heavy they shall make the punishments simply to compel the people to circulate the notes. But in proportion as the punishments became more severe, the use made of the notes became less. <laughs> right? yeah. and, I, I, and I love that because it, it, it just shows that I mean, and, the, and my goodness, think about you know, the punishments that Chinese can inflict in the 14th century. Um, but but despite the, the brutality that the Chinese and, of course, the Romans, too, could bear against the market, the market simply didn't function. It just simply said, enough, we're not going to do this anymore. And so I think that the point is that looking at history, we are going to get to the same place. Uh, uh, and and sooner because they're not gonna you know they're not gonna give us wa water torture I don't think to circulate the notes uh, I think it'll end before that but the point is you reach a point where these things simply do not work and people will not circulate them for any reason even if you threaten capital punishment I I, hope, so, I really I really hope you're right about this Dan but it seems that a lot of people whether it's in China the United States Europe are just brainwashed and so a lot of people will go along unfortunately not everyone but a good amount of people still will go along almost with whatever the government says. So if the government says, you know, we're issuing a new RMB, we're doing a big devaluation, it's just going to be more fiat currency, we're doing a de devaluation, we're issuing a new dollar, it's going to be devalued 30 or 40% overnight. It seems, unfortunately, I hope I'm wrong about this, but a lot of people right now would go along with it. Now, maybe this will change because inflation and taxes in people's everyday lives, it seems, are going up every year especially if you live in California or some of these really heavily regulated, heavily taxed states in the United States. I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I, I, the point is this is what happens the end game. I mean, obviously, the, the, it took a century for the Mongol money to stop circulating. So I mean, that, during that time, it did work until finally it didn't. And, and, and that's another point, which is that when you look at financial market history, um, you don't usually see smooth trends, right? You, I mean, things go along and they just stop overnight. Uh, and and I mean, the gold price itself, if you look at uh, the gold price in various currencies, uh, in various currency crises, gold is not good at predicting them. It doesn't, you know, steadily start rising a month or two or a year before it happens. It goes along merrily doing its thing, and then one day it just jumps fifty percent or a hundred percent or two hundred percent or some number like that. Right? Things just stop, and so uh, it, it's a good lesson because again, you know, you're in the gold market, and like, yeah, you know, twelve hundred uh, still, uh, twelve fifty, whatever it is. Down from 1900, when is it ever going to go up again? And you get, and you sort of get despairing, and you start thinking, well, what am I doing in this in this horrible market? But again, it, it's not going to tell you that. I think what's going to happen is one day you're going to wake up, or maybe it's a week, or maybe it's a month. I don't know. But very a very short period of time, you're going to see gold jump from where it is now to 50 percent higher, or 100 percent higher, or numbers like that. And if you're not in the market when that happens, you will simply miss it. 
and we're recording this interview on Thursday, November 1st, 2018. The gold price is at 1233. So the gold price is basically maybe either at or a little bit above the marginal cost of production for gold. So if the gold price went much lower, I mean, a lot of the primary gold miners would be in big, big trouble, potential bankruptcy. I just don't think there's capital available. So what's your opinion then on the gold and silver mining industry? Because we've had basically a paper bear market now for gold and silver for seven years. Okay, we've had some rallies along the way. The miners, whenever there was a rally for gold and silver prices, they would sell a lot of shares, you know, maybe take on more debt or try to raise cash as quickly as possible to fix their balance sheets. But it seems that we're at a gold and silver price where it can't it can't go much lower, but it's also kind of stuck. So do you think then we're going to go sideways for a lot longer or do you think then that we're going to have a move in the next couple of years? Well, let me, let me make two comments. First of all, I, I you know, for most Commodities, you're correct. If the price of the commodity goes below the marginal cost of production of the cost curve, then it just stops because producers go to business and then the supply dries up. That is not true for gold. Don't forget that all of gold mining globally only adds to the above ground supply, only adds 1.5%. Gold, people don't throw gold out. You know, you don't use it like oil in your car, it's gone, right? You keep it. So so gold can definitely go to a price that bankrupts all of the miners and not care about that. So, um, and, and the converse is also true, right? Again, mo in, in most commodities, and all their commodities, if, they, if it gets too high, that then you bring on uh, not just new supply, but you start economizing on its use. And so that, that, that squelches the, 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 the where it can go on the upside. And again, that is not true for gold. Gold can go high... To, to a place where all the mines are making huge amounts of money. And it's very hard to bring a new gold money into production, as you, as you know. And, uh, and and you don't economize in use because it is money. So there's no, there's no economizing it. So uh, this is why gold mining is such a volatile business, because it doesn't have those those buffers that other industries have. It, it, it can bankrupt everyone. It can make everyone rich. So, so it makes it you know, challenging and also a lot of fun. Uh, but in answer to your question, I think... On the uh, on the capital um, allocation side, you know the the reason the industry is such a bad place. I think my theory is that all of these executives are compensated with call options, right? They they get uh, they get warrants in their own stock. Now, if you have a call option, the the easiest way to juice the value of that call option is to increase volatility. And that's just Black Scholes option modeling. So, and the way you increase volatility of your of your stock, of your gold stock, if you're the CEO, is you take a lot of debt. You take a lot of debt and you buy a big marginal property. And then, if your commodity, be it gold or oil or anything else, uh, goes higher, you make a huge amount of money personally because your stock goes crazy and you make lots of money in your stock options. If it goes down, well, then you refinance, you wipe out the equity guys, and and you start again. Right? So that that's that's how the industry is organized, and so. Um, so it, it, it's, it explains you know, why these things are so volatile and why there's such capital traps for investors over long periods of time. Well, the, the way I look at them is as insurance contracts because, because you know these guys are levering up everywhere they can. When gold does run, these things go bananas, right? And so uh, if you keep your allocation small enough, uh, it, can, it can really bail you out of – a big market crash. So that's how I, you know, I, how, that's the way I think of it. Um, when the broader markets crash, these, especially the junior gold mining stocks, go absolutely nuts. And so they can help you balance your exposure. And again, they usually do badly, usually because they're very bad at capital allocators, but that usually is the time when the rest of the market is going up. So if you think of gold miners not as a discrete investment, where it's just horribly volatile and underperforms over long periods of time tremendously. If you think of it as a component of a portfolio, it makes much more sense. And and you need to have the discipline to keep your allocation proper uh, to to manage uh, a, a portfolio and not just, as I say, a, a single discrete investment. So if I could simplify for our listeners what you just said, it sounds like you're saying that the interests of the management teams running these gold mines is not properly aligned with the interests of the shareholders, even though the management teams claim that they're doing certain things for the shareholders. No, of course, not all. It's not all aligned with a long-term shareholder. Right? They're rent-seeking against shareholders. They're, they're pursuing their own interests, and of course, everybody does. There's nothing wrong with that. The, what's wrong is the structure allows them to do that by giving themselves uh, a call options uh, that that again that incentivize them to make their companies more volatile, and and that is the problem with the industry. So when John Paulson organizes a a, a group to try to uh, get the companies to behave better. I mean, of course, it's going to fail because it's not in their interest to do so. You, you need to change the 
the compensation structures, if you're going to have any hope of having these guys uh, you know, allocate capital well over the long term. Again, if you're using these things for insurance purposes, the way I do, then I don't mind so much that there that there's you know monkeys levering them up because because what it, what it does is it makes these things much more sensitive so that when they pay off they pay off tremendously and again I think we're 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 nearing a point very nearing a point where when gold is going to fly and then all of a sudden the, the the worst operators will do the best because the guys who are most most levered up will, will actually ironically uh, get bailed out by the market so it's a bad long term strategy I'm I'm very against it intellectually. Uh, and it prevents large amounts of capital from coming in. This, that's why you don't see a lot of institutional capital coming into the space because they know that there's this rent seeking game. But on the other hand, if you get the speculation timing right, uh, you can do very, very well. Uh, and, and again, you know, if you're a speculator, if you're not, then the way to think about it is as insurance. And you, you hope you lose all your money in your in your fire insurance in your house because it means your house didn't burn down. Um, but if your house burns down, it's going to pay off at a thousand to one, so you can buy a new house. I mean, I think if you think of it that way, th- th- then you can get you can get past the the rent seeking that that management is constantly doing against shareholders. Yeah, I was going to bring that up that there's research reports out there, whether it's by John Paulson, the hedge fund manager, or by the other guy on oh I forgot his name. He did an interview with Real Vision TV last month, and he said that 150 billion dollars in the last decade has been wasted by gold miners in bad deals. Meanwhile, you know, almost none of these gold miners. Uh, the CEOs of these gold miners has gone fired and they've still paid themselves millions of dollars in salary and stock option. So to me, you know, someone who cares about transparency and honesty and, and wants, you know, better publicly run companies that are more transparent without accounting fraud, I think those managed CEOs should have been fired. But apparently the industry has decided to not or, fire or, most or of them. Or arrested. <laughs> or, or arrested. Well, I mean, there's there's so many uh, um, examples of egregious accounting fraud now, and almost no one's going to jail for it. So, I mean, the gold miners are like tiny minor thieves, misdemeanor thieves compared to like the uh, amount of accounting fraud that's going on at some of the larger companies. True. So I know, Dan, that you specialize on juniors. So are there actually any juniors that are act, that are getting capital right now that are having success raising money and drilling? Or is the industry like basically in almost dead, you know, zombie-esque, maybe they're keeping their offices in Vancouver open, uh, they're planning on doing drilling maybe next year, they've raised a little bit of money. So what's your view on the state of the juniors? Yeah, so um, it's the, the reason people buy juniors is because um, if you read any statistics on gold mining, the, the majors are running through the reserves, right? The gold, it's, gold's been so low, they've had very little money to reinvest in exploration and acquisition. So all the big or most of the big miners are in big, big trouble. But the problem is they don't have any cash. They've got no free cash to go invest in new projects. Uh, so they're just trying to stay alive. So the, the juniors are there. And what should be happening is that the, the majors should be investing in these people, either taking private placements, doing joint ventures, that kind of thing, money flowing into them uh, to create the next gold mines of the next cycle. And then what happens is third-party investors see that happening and they put their capital in it because they know that the, the, they'll be acquired eventually by the big guys. And, and the problem is at the moment, at $1,200 gold, the big companies are not making money. Um, if you think about not their reported earnings, the reported cash flow from the the, the, the Alice they mined in a particular quarter, which they discovered 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but you think about the next ounce that they have to replace it ounce with. They, they got to discover a new ounce, right? And then build capital and dig it up, all the op- OPEX and CAPEX costs. Uh, that number, I, you know, uh, my understanding is up at $1,400 an ounce, some number like that. So as long as you're below that number, the industry is actually losing capital. They might be in cash flow, but they're losing capital. And so they have no appetite to go uh, expand. And so the juniors are really, really suffering because uh, if, if the big guys aren't going to support them, then the, then the, the, the third-party capitalists don't want to either. And so, yes, a lot of them are, 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 are back in survival mode where they were in, in, in 2014-15. But again, what will solve this problem is when gold starts to run again, and I think it will soon, uh, and gets above that fourteen hundred dollar number and starts right. You know, I think it'll run once it clears that quite a bit higher. All of a sudden, there'll be a scramble because these guys are so uh, deficient in terms of playing with the future of, of, of their of their operations. I think there'll be a scramble into the better juniors to to uh, to finance them and acquire them. Uh, and and they're so cheap right now. I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity. So. 
I think we discussed this on the last interview that you said you work with geologists to do research. So the average retail investor probably should not be buying their own juniors and doing their own due diligence. Obviously, this is not financial advice. We're not talking about any specific companies. But, you know, I've just heard horror stories out there about juniors that are advertising on like YouTube videos or other stuff. And then all of a sudden, you know, they issue a press release and the stock crashes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, uh, you know, you, you, the ETFs are supposed to solve that problem, right? If you're if you're not focused in the industry and you just want exposure, you can go by the GX, GXJ. And the, and the problem with that, especially in this segment of the market, is what, what winds up happening is, like today was a big up day, right? So all this money floods into these instruments. Uh, and so then, then the managers of these things have to go buy stocks, get all this cash that they got to deploy it. So they... Buy all these stocks at the ask, push the price up, right? And then, you know, tomorrow, we'll, they go down $30. And then they'll have to sell. They'll sell the bid because all, all the capital will leave and we'll take the money out. And so then they're going to sell the bid and push the prices down. And so you have enormous, enormous drag. Uh, uh, just just the, the volatility really, really kills you in these things. And then on top of that, um, the way ETFs are constructed is – uh, uh, mostly capitalization weighted. And so by definition, they own the largest companies uh, the most and then smaller. And in a way they have to because of the liquidity problems, they have to be able to come in and out of the big companies a lot and, and less than the smaller companies. But in gold mining, uh, size is your enemy. It just, it kills you, right? When you look at the big companies, they've, they've been disasters. And the reason is because they, they all want to grow or at least stay the same size. And to do that, you have to expend huge amounts of capital on these enormous projects that have tremendous amounts of problems, and uh, and that's what we've seen. Whereas some, some you know intermediate guys that have maybe one mine <laughs> that they can mine and just keep pushing back and keep exploring and keep expanding, uh, they're, they're just not big enough to accept these flows of capital in and out of them. So so the, the big the big operas have big big problems. But then again, if you're if you really take a, how do you identify who they are? And I, I don't know the answer to that. And the junior producers or the mid-tier producers often have to bet the whole company on a new mine. So if they're bringing a sizable mine onto production, they have to take out debt and equity, and they have to basically bet most, if not all, the entire company on a mine. And look what's happened recently in the last couple of years to Primero Mining. They had two mines go bad, and now with New Gold, yeah. and now with New Gold, which and, is the and, newest. And you on a gold fields just last week. I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's it's very tricky. It's very tricky. There's no, there's no question. And I mean, you know. As you say, those, those companies in particular had tons of debt, and they did some dumb acquisitions, and and um, and they caught up with it. They, they weren't very good managers. I mean, you have to look at the people and and the assets. And uh, um, you know, New Gold was very aggressive rolling things up. It worked very very well as long as prices were going up. It didn't so work so well on on, on the way down. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a tricky space. I mean, there's, there's no there's no question, and there's no easy answer. I mean, that's why I spent so much time doing diligence and talking to to people I respect, analysts I respect in the field who know the people and the assets, because all these assets have long histories. Uh, and, and so trying to get a sense of, of where they are. And then the other thing I try to do is keep a very broad portfolio. So that if I do make a mistake, I, you know, I don't get cleaned off the board because they're, they're also good mistakes. I mean, sometimes you, you own a company and they have a great drill hole or they get bought out or something happens and they and they do very well. So, you know, I, I think you don't want all your eggs in one basket in this, in this industry. Uh, you, you can't do the big, uh, uh, the, the big ETFs because you get killed in those. Um, and uh, I mean, I used to do your own, your own homework. It's not easy, but you got to do it. I agree. So Dan, I want to thank you again for your time today. If our listeners want to follow your work and maybe get an update from you when your book's going to be out about financial history, how did they do so? Yeah, so I've got a website, uh, mermicon.com. That's M-Y-R-M-I-K-A-N. And uh, I, you, know, you can sign up for my, my monthly letter for free. It's not always monthly, it's not just bi-monthly. But you sign up for free, and uh, I'll definitely let my list know when the, when the book is ready. And I'm, I'm very excited about it. I, I don't think anyone's written a book like this, you know, treating economics as a humanity for at least 100 years. So it, as I said, I'm, I'm basically taking a, a, a that approach and just updating uh, uh, that approach for the last century and, and showing how it's all it's all the same story nothing has changed so and you know, knowing that can can give you a leg up on on thinking about what's what's going to happen next and before i let you go you spent over five years worth of research on this right researching and writing this and in, in addition to that you have a funny story about a publisher right you're you're potentially going to get a mainstream publisher and then they heard it's about gold right and they they walked away 
Yeah, I don't want to embarrass the, the picket party, but it was a it was a uh, it was a prominent uh, uh, a university, and and um, uh, and and the, the, the top guy wanted to do wanted to publish the book, and then the committee found out it was with the gold standard and killed the project. I mean, of course, right? Because uh, it, no one in academic uh, circles want to support these ideas because it diminishes their power. I mean, so it makes perfect sense. Uh, but it was just it was amusing to see that thesis validated by the actions of of the universities. Yep. Ignore, ignore, ignore confirmation bias. Unfortunately, that's a lot of the problems that we have today is because of confirmation bias, people ignoring the signals of reality. Yeah, but it's not just ignoring them. It's, it's in their self-interest not to know, right? Exactly. I mean, it, they have all this power, they get all this money and power out of it. You know, why on earth would they would they want to con- consider that it's all fraud? Which, of course, it is, but, but they, they don't want to admit it. It's, of course not. Yes. And this is a problem with central banking and fiat money and big government. So I want to thank you again for your time today, Dan. I really appreciate it. And I think our listeners are going to find a lot of value in this content. Well, thanks for having me on. Please like this video, share it with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe to the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Thanks for helping Wall Street for Main Street pass the 20,000 YouTube channel subscriber milestone despite YouTube censorship. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to 30,000 or even 40,000 YouTube channel subscribers quickly if YouTube doesn't shut down this channel. If YouTube does shut down this channel, remember to also sign up for the Wall Street for Main Street email list that's on the wallstreetformainstreet.com website and we'll tell you where the videos are going to be uploaded instead of YouTube. Also, if you really like the content and you decide that you want to give a one-time donation, you can go to the wallstreetformainstreet.com website where there's different options for you to do so. Or you can become a Patreon contributor. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to providing my loyal listeners with some of the best information, analysis, and financial education available out there, free or paid, as I work to grow the podcast and also get my educational technology company funded.